thank you for this very nice introduction. Um, a Fool, um, a novel by Florin Wappa, is turning 50 this year. It was first published in 1966. So I like to thank the organizers, first of all, of, for this, for doing it again, for putting this wonderful conference forward, and also for making space to celebrate Ifuru and commemorate um, the appearance of her first book, of Florin Wappa's first book. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the first novel, and I brought a copy of Ifuru, and I should say this is sort of a very old, used, uh, old, decrepit copy. I, I love this old copy because of the image. The image is so, um, you know, it, there's this woman from, who's paddling on Oguta Lake, and it's a very, um, it's a very real image for me. Um, it's been out of print for a while, but I heard that now Ifuru is available again from Wavelet Press in the in the United States, <clears throat> and from Pearson here in in um, here in England. But for some reason, it was too difficult to to get copies for the conference, but um, it's out there. So if you want to read the novel, it is back in print. Um, the first novel by Nigeria's first lady of letters was a milestone in African, <coughs> excuse me, African women's writing and a first in many ways. Florin Wapa hailed from Oguta in today's Imo state of southeastern Nigeria. Florin Wapa's natal family belongs to the town's early Christian upper social strata. Florin Wapa was one of Nigeria's first highly educated women. She studied at Ibadan University with Gino Achebe and also in Edinburgh, Scotland. She later lived and worked in Lagos, Madukuri, and Inugu, among other places. Yet throughout her life and career, Florin Wapa always kept closely in touch with her hometown, Oguta. <coughs> An ethnographer, I've spent much time in the Oguta area where I've studied Oro Igbo culture over the past 30 plus years. Beginning with a year long stay in 1978-79 and have documented my findings in multiple articles in ethnography, which is the book, this book, <laughs> and um, ethnographic films. I found two highly significant cultural features that are very highly relevant to Florin Wapa's writings. First of all, patrilinear kinship is the foundation of Oguta society. The town of Oguta is made up of patrilinear kin groups, the Umuna, locally known as villages. Each comprises up to 200 members or more. An Umuna is a consanguine group which means that membership is defined as directly related by blood and therefore exogamous. Thus, members of an umuna may not marry within the group and must find suitable partners outside. An individual's identity, place in society and access to its resources, for men, most importantly the land, the farmland, is defined by his or her paternal kin group. Membership in the Omuna is inherited exclusively from one's father. Inheritance runs from father to son to son and continues forever. The kin group is perpetuated through patrilinear lines of descent from father to son and so on. As a result, men need male children in order for their personal line to continue within the group. Children in general, but especially male children, are an Igbo or Oguta man and woman's greatest desire. And you can challenge me later <laughs> if you think I'm wrong. <clears throat> childless, this does not mean that childless women are not necessarily ostracized. Yet, kin groups commonly exert substantial pressure on their male members to continue their line through sons. If a couple cannot deliver male children for their husband's kin group, they may be encouraged to expand the family by way of a co-wife who might bear male children. Some Oguta women may even choose to marry a co-wife for their husbands. The heroine of Nwapa's novel Efuru does not object to her first and second husband marrying a second wife in case she herself would remain childless and provided she was consulted. 
A dutiful wife, a fool herself, even suggests marrying a second wife to her husband, Gilbert. So I'm quoting from a fool. Anybody, and this is interesting because a fool um, calls her second husband by his evil name, Annie Berry, while Annie Berry also had an English name, Gilbert. And of course, because of his education, as we heard earlier, he was sort of forced to have an English name, <laughs> just as a sidekick. But uh, Florian Wappa was very critical also of this whole name issue. So a fool says to her husband, uh, Annie Berry, I'm thinking of getting a second wife for you. Why? Gilbert asked, surprised. You know why. This is the fourth year in our marriage and I have not had an issue for you. We have lived happily these years and I'm worried. If we get another wife, a young girl, she will have children for you and I will love the children because they are your own children. I may not like your choice, Gilbert said. That is no problem. You are going to be shown several girls and you are to make your choice. I don't like quite the arrangement. I don't care whether we have a child or not. And no, please be frank. You do care. Don't feel for me. All men care for children. If you don't like the method I want to use, say so. Perhaps you want me to leave it entirely in your hands? Not exactly that. Well, if you want it that way, I won't insist. But see my mother about it. Yes, I shall see your mother about it. She is going to help too. All right, it is settled then. Let's go to the stream and they go swimming. In the modern world and in Christian practice, this would be a problematic solution. The heroine of Efu is an Oguta woman who, ha who only has one daughter. When she loses her only child, she becomes a childless woman. Moreover, a fool worships the late goddess Uhamri and, and even dreams of the goddess as being childless herself. So the second cultural feature, which is highly relevant to Florin Wappa's writings, are local beliefs in Uhuta's late goddess Uhamri, who is also known as Ogwide, and in her life-giving powers. Water is a source of life. <clears throat> this knowledge is expressed by many people around the world in their veneration of the life-giving and sustaining medium water. The people of Oguta, for example, have worshipped and adored Uhamri, the goddess of Oguta Lake, since times immemorial, according to Florin Wappa. The town's major behavioral norms, and especially reproductive norms, are attributed to this deity. Uamari embodies the female side of the universe as expressed in the generic notion of a mother water goddess whose preeminent position in the pantheon of Igbo deities has been described by Mrs. Chinui Achebe and others. Uhamari was highly venerated as Aguta's patron deity before the advent of Christianity and colonialism and well beyond into the second half of the 20th century. Even in the 1980s, the late goddess was the major reference point in the daily life of Oguta and other towns of the area. She, the late goddess, was believed to be the harbinger of life and significant in the eternal cycle of life, death, and reincarnation. She was highly revered as the mythical mother of the Oro Ibo. In the past, all behavioral norms, and especially those uh, regarding sexuality, procreation, and childbearing were ascribed to the late goddess Uhamri. These reproductive norms included the controversial practice of female circumcision or female genital mutilation, customarily performed at puberty or latest before a newlywed became pregnant. Female circumcision was referred to locally as a girl or a woman's taking her bath and had largely been, uh, largely been abolished and, or modified during my first long, year-long stay in Oguta in 1978-79. Florin Wappa's first novel, Efuru, was first published in 1966 and tells of a time when female circumcision was still largely believed to be a prerequisite for the late 
for the water goddess blessings and help towards children's survival. Nwapa's heroine Ifuru is a brave and dutiful woman. She undergoes the procedure in her mother-in-law's house before the birth of her first child. However, Nwapa indicates a reconsideration of the custom. Quote, <clears throat> the next morning, the woman was at Ifuru's. She sat down and Ifuru came out to greet her. You are the young wife, my daughter. You are beautiful, my daughter. I will be gentle with you. Don't be afraid. It is painful, no doubt, but the pain disappears like hunger. You know what? And she turned to Ifuru's mother-in-law. You know Nwakego's daughter? Yes, I know her. She didn't have her bath before she had that baby who died after the dreadful flood. God forbid, why? Fear, it was fear, foolish girl. She had a foolish mother. Their folly cost them a son, a good son. How did you know? They came to me early one morning and told me they wanted it to be done in my house so that people will not know. The DBI had already told them that the baby died because she didn't have her bath. I did it for them. She remained in my house for seven days. Is everything ready now? Yes, come this way. The woman ran to the back of the house and there it was done. Ifuru screamed and screamed. It was so painful. Her mother-in-law consoled her. It will soon be over, my daughter. Don't cry. In Noapa's second novel, Idu, a woman evades her daughter's circumcision by faking it. This story indicates that change was covertly on its way and that Igbo or Oguta custom is capable of changing. It is not as static as has been suggested by colonial literature. An Oguta law scholar, Leslie Obiora, corroborates this view and describes Igbo custom as dynamic and quite capable of adjusting to changing times and circumstances. Oguta's economics and her cultural activities are traditionally linked to water and connected to the beliefs in local water deities. The farming cycle revolves around the flooding and receding of Oguta Lake, the river Urashi, the Niger and adjacent rivers and creeks. These timed events are marked by cultural happenings. The ecological connection between water, female fecundity, patrilinear kinship and the major economic activities of farming and fishing is manifest in the town's annual O masquerade and festival. This masquerade is based in a myth outlining the foundations of patrilinear society. Moreover, the name of the major Owu mask is Akarucha. After gossiping, you still desire it. In her novel Ifuru, Nwapa drew a very subtle connection between Owu and female fecundity in connection with Ifuru's pregnancy. I can't go into the details now. So throughout my field research, I have recorded numerous interviews, prayers, songs, and divination sessions in the Aguta area between 1978 and 1994. All of these oral texts attest to the people's desire for children, especially sons, and moreover to their veneration for Uhamari, the lake goddess, woman, the life giver. The Yoguta people saw people's awe for the water deity was based on their strong beliefs in water and women's ability to give children. Uguta's lake goddess was credited with giving and sustaining life. Life giving was her primary attribute, although her power to take life was also acknowledged and feared and addressed by traditional herbalists. Uhamari was the embodiment of the female side of the universe endowed with the power to give children. Female fecundity and procreation were highly valued qualities fundamental to Oguta's patrilinear society. Now, Flora and Wapa challenged Oguta society's core values, beliefs, and practices from a modern female perspective. Ifuru was a provocative novel at the time of its first appearance in 1966. The socio-cultural environment of the novel Ifuru 
as well as the individual characters and their words are highly realistic. A person familiar with the area will immediately recognize her Uguta, her inhabitants, their daily lives and concerns. The novel's story may appear timeless, but a closer look reveals a time frame during the colonial time and during or shortly after World War II. This is clearly evident when a friend of Ifuru's second husband returns home and recounts how he was drafted into the British Army to serve overseas. The novel is based on life at Oguta in the 1940s or 1950s and appeared in 1966, soon after Nigeria's independence. Yet, yet much of what happens in, and is said in the novel was still evident to this author in the, in the late 1970s and 1980s up into the 1990s. Nwapa's fiction is deeply grounded in her own ethnicity. Yet, Nwapa's writing is also highly provocative. An ethnographer like me may initially be puzzled about some of her propositions. For example, when she mentions Ifuru's doubts in the lake goddess' ability to give children. Quoting again, as she lay at, awake at, that night, she thought of Uhamri, she being Ifuru, of course. Of course. Perhaps she will visit me this night. Perhaps I shall dream one of those sweet dreams about her. She will show me her riches, trinkets, ornaments, and big fishes she used for her firewood. Then suddenly it struck her that since she had started to worship Uhamri, she had never seen babies in her abode. Can she give me children, she said aloud. If her husband was sleeping with her, he would have heard her and asked what it was all about. She cannot give me children because she hasn't got children of herself. So that was a very strange dream, actually. Uhamri is Oguta's patron deity. For Flora and Wapa to raise doubts in the patron deity's most valuable gift, children, was highly provocative. Moreover, some readers have, have been misled about the Aguta people's ancient and most sacred beliefs to assume that worshiping the goddess Ohamari would require a woman's childlessness. One American author has even misunderstood Nwapa's message to suggest that, and I quote, ironically, although Ohamari brings fertility to both land and water, she is unable to bring fertility to women. In Igbo cosmology, the deity Uhamri can grant women wealth, but never children, unquote. Such an idea would appear preposterous to the locals at the time of Nwapa's writings, and even in the late 70s, 80s, and 90s when I was there. And it was also not the author's intent, as we shall see below. In view of the society's adoration of the lake goddess, life-giving qualities, Flora Nwapa's novel Efu was highly provocative and critical. In addition, proselytes aiming at eroding ancient beliefs, beliefs and denigrating African spirituality, beliefs, and practices. Yet this also was not Flora Nwapa's intent, for she had her own agenda. There is an important distinction between ethnic fiction and ethnography. We must acknowledge the veracity of the insider novelist's insight. Yet at the same time, a novelist voices her understanding differently from a historian, an economist, a political scientist, social scientist, folklorist, or an ethnographer such as me. A novel is a work of art, and the artist may take more artistic liberties than permissible for a social scientist or an ethnographer. A novel must not be taken literally. Instead, we may read it carefully to distinguish between fictitious characters and events on the one hand, and the general cultural background on the other. Furthermore, ethnic fiction may contain a meta-text critical of the author's own culture, as illustrated by Floran Wappa. Floran Wappa's statements on the childlessness of Oguta's lake goddess are one example of the author's insider's critique of her own people's obsession with female fecundity. 
while deeply steeped in her own ethnicity, the novelist had her own agenda. Her art differs from ethnography. Nwapa challenged certain beliefs and cultural practices by deconstructing them rather than merely objectively describing the culture as an ethnographer would. Flora Nwapa expressed ambivalence towards the late goddess preeminent gift, female fecundity. In her novel, Flora Nwapa depicted the late goddess Uhamari and the significance of her, her gifts, particularly for women, in a slightly different character than that endorsed by the, lo the locals. Nwapa's decision to digress from traditional views was certainly not based in ignorance. She was well versed in the beliefs of her people and voiced a highly educated insider's critique of local custom, yet with a degree of ambivalence. The heroine of, Efuru, of Nwapa's first novel, Efuru, was wealthy and had only one daughter who died, making her childless. Efuru was, highly success, was a highly successful businesswoman who accumulated wealth other than children. Uguta women are historically known as entrepreneurial, wealthy, and successful traders and businesswomen. Yet the deepest desire, greatest pride, and wealth of the, or of the rural Oro Ibo is having children, especially sons. Children were regarded as congruent with wealth, as attested in many proverbs, songs, and names, such as kego, short for noa ka ego, child is better than money. Both wealth and children were not only equated, but also equally credited to the lake goddess. Nwapa's artistic choice choices challenged the established norms and values of Oguta society, perceived as contradictory to modern Western feminist ideas and standards. Flora Nwapa was highly educated and trained in Europe. While she always remained grounded and at home at, in, at home in Oguta culture and society, she was also a womanist who featured women's issues in her writings and promoted women's rights as a writer and educator and a politician throughout her life and career. Even today, there is a lot of pressure on Uguta women to get married and bear as many children as early as possible before considering money making, entering a business venture, or starting a career. This mindset continues despite modernization and education. The childless heroines of Nwapa's early novels face difficult lives despite their wealth and success in business. Their problems resulted from the traditional child-oriented mindset and its focus on sons. These women were plagued by unhappy marriages and circumstances beyond their control. In their despair, they turned to Uhamri, the lake goddess, as a source of consolation and empowerment. Some interpretations of Nwapa's text suggest a dichotomy between motherhood and personal success for Uguta women as is often the case in Western society. Others would assume that personal devotion to the lake goddess would promote acquisition of wealth but not children, as in the popular mummy water myth, or that only possessed women would serve the water deity, or that the lake goddess might even take children away, as in Wapa's children's book, Mummy Water, and in Christian discourse. None of this, of course, is true. First, wealth and children were traditionally conceived as one. Secondly, the priesthood of Oguta's revered lake goddess was traditionally male and inherited, while vocation was an additional avenue for any man or woman. And third, prayers to the lake goddess normally focus on her life-giving powers. A stout promoter of women's rights, Nwapa challenged and deconstructed local beliefs and practices. Her ideas of female empowerment, primarily via monetary or personal success, may have been indebted to her Western education. Marriages, for example, were traditionally arranged between families in Oguta, and in this setting, a marriage was more than a relationship between two individuals. Instead, marriages involved complicated and reciprocal relationships between in-laws and large groups of people, 
Moreover, the pact involved the children's membership in their father's umuna, sealed by, by payment of child wells known as bride price, which uh, Nwapa erroneously calls dowry, because dowry is something else. It's practiced in India. <clears throat> Thus, villagers carefully examined the background and perspective of prospective spouses and their extended families before entering such a relationship. Such arrangements are quite different from Western ideas of love at first sight. Contrary to Oguta cultural practices, Flora Nwapa's heroine Ifuru elopes with her first husband, but pays the child wealth to her father later. Another couple also marries against the wishes of the wise family. Their story presents another sublime reference to an ancient custom in Oguta. There, girls once enjoyed premarital sexual liberties. However, a girl's lover had to hand over his loincloth to the husband once the girl got married. In Nwapa's story, Nwosu and Nwabata were lovers, but Nwabata's family did not approve of Nwosu, and her brother tore up Nwosu's loincloth. Nwabata had bought it for him. She insisted on marrying him against all odds. Their marriage was a happy one, but they remained poor. Flora Nwapa's greatest challenge to Guta culture was when she seemed to question the late goddess' power to give children and by extension her gift of fecundity as woman's sole asset. However, Nwapa's goal was not to unravel Uguta Ibo culture and identity. Nwapa perhaps unintentionally played with fire when she challenged indigenous belief in the lake goddess' ability to give and protect life. Such doubting corroborates Christian missionary ideologies. Proselytes have subverted indigenous beliefs in southeastern Nigeria since hundreds of years. Their derision and demonization of sacred beliefs has resulted in widespread fear, destruction of shrines, and the persecution of adherents of pre-Christian religious beliefs to this day. Flora Nwapa was a Christian, but she did not champion westernization at the expense of undermining her Oguta Ibo culture, its language, or its sacred beliefs. She did not wish to demolish the people's reverence of their late goddess, nor her life-giving attribute. In an interview I recorded in 1988, Nwapa asserted that water is the life-giving thing. She was also, in the same interview, she expressed that she was horrified by the words of her parish priest, who did not mince words when he attempted to discredit the late goddess of Buide as a savior to whom the people of Oguta expressed their gratitude after the Civil War. The characters of Nwapa's novel, novels also express concern over foreign meddling in the imp and the impact of missionaries. Another example. Gilbert laughed. You know what? I was nearly robbed of all my money in Onicha Market. The god of my fathers is awake. Tell me, how did, that, how did it happen? Ifuru asked, sit, sitting up. Immediately I returned, I told my mother, and she sacrificed to our ancestors. How is that? You go to church. What about that? I shall give the pastor some money to, the, to thank God for it. I see. I can never understand you churchgoers. Um, in, an, in another incident, two women talk about a burglary. It is very bad. They stole everything. What are we going to do about thieves in this town? The world is bad. In my youth, there was no stealing. Um, I said, but these churchgoers have spoiled everything. They tell us our gods have no power, so our people continue to steal." Unquote. Nwapa also expressed concern about damages done by forcing people to abandon their Igbo names. Names are important to a person's identity, especially in a culture where names and naming were taken very seriously and linked to the concept of reincarnation. And we've heard a wonderful paper this morning about uh, about names, the, the names as a logo. Discrediting a person's Igbo name and replacing it with a foreign European name undermines his or her personal identity 
ethics, economics, and family relations. In her last, not yet as unpublished manuscript, The Lake Goddess, Florin Wappa illuminated this issue in a conversation between a man's mother-in-law, Mama Teresa, a fanatic Christian, and his mother, Noafor, who is also known as Teresa. Their English names are as confusing as the identities of the Christian namesakes they obscure. In her novel, Efuru, Florin Wappa challenged and deconstructed some of her people's belief, for example, in the lake goddess and her gifts. Yet Nwapa rejected the undermining of the Igbo language and culture. Moreover, Flora Nwapa even injected words of caution into her own critique and challenges. So I want to take a brief look at Nwapa's cautions. Challenging the late goddess, woman's power to give children superficially appears to be the novel a Furo's primary theme. However, an underlying message runs between the lines of a Furo. Nwapa questions, Nwapa's questions, Nwapa questions the widespread but faulty charge that successful wealthy women are necessarily childless. This is evident on several counts. First of all, a fool's vision of the childless divine woman of the lake is only a dream. Secondly, a fool herself never states that the lake goddess prevented her from conceiving. And third, the doubts and allegations against the lake goddess Uhamri and her heroine, and her heroine Ifuru, a successful but childless woman, are voiced by a liar, a malicious and deviant character. And I quote again, Umirima's voice was heard from a distance and Ogea frowned. She is coming, the gossip Ogea said under her breath. She has never in her life said anything good about anybody. I wonder who is going to be her next victim? She is always running people down. The only, this is the only enemy of Efuru, the successful but childless woman. She is a negative character, a liar. This deceitful woman denigrates the lake goddess and her worshippers and moreover claims that only barren women worship Uhamuri. When Efuru chose to follow the lake goddess, the same evil woman gossips behind her back. Do I hear that she now has Uhamri in her bedroom, Umirima sneered? That's what I hear. She and her husband plunged into it. I was not consulted. She has spoiled everything. This is bad. How many women in this town who worship Uhamri have children? Answer me, Amedi, how many? Your daughter-in-law must be a foolish woman to go into that. Nwapa introduced multiple cautions against adopting, adopting such negativity at face value. Umirima, who affronts Ifuru, is quite a negative character, known to be malicious. She is not only, she is not highly respected in the community, in contrast to the positive but childless heroine Ifuru. Umirima disputes Uhamri's power to give children, a belief commonly held by the locals and under attack by foreign proselytizers. Umirima attacks Ifuru for worshiping the lake goddess, Uhamri, and that's Uguta's patron deity. So in a way, everybody worships Uhamri. Umirima later wrongfully accuses Ifuru of adultery. Um, and this uh, uh, Umirima's accusation destroys Ifuru's second marriage. After the, after the death of her child from her previous marriage, Ifuru's second marriage was her last and only acceptable chance to conceive again. The destruction of this marriage, it is the, dis, the destruction of this marriage through the faulty accusation that makes her childless. Then the, the destruction of a full second marriage also pre precludes society's hope for a child because child, children are always wanted and welcome. Omirima wrongfully accuses the heroine Ifu of something she didn't do. By extension, the malicious woman equally wrongfully invents an invalid contradiction between motherhood and a woman's worth and success in life. This faulty dichotomy is paired with wrongful accusations against the late goddess Uhamri of not having or not giving children, causing childlessness, or even killing children. All of these are negative ideas promoted by proselytizers out to destroy Igbo traditional religious beliefs and culture. 
but, not, but this was not Florian Wappa's goal. So my conclusion is that there are, that Florian, Wappa's, Florian Wappa's work is highly dialectical. There are the, there are the dialectics of Florian Wappa. Florian Wappa was concerned with women's well-being in general. In pursuit of her agenda, she played with, deconstructed, and challenged the basic tenor of local beliefs. Yet, the author introduced cautionary messages by contrasting negative and positive characters. Wappa recognized that pursuing both children and a business or a career poses a serious dilemma to modern women worldwide. Yet, Florin Wappa also alerted us to the issue that questioning the child or life-giving aspect of the water goddess, woman, would implicitly also question the benefit of children, that is, life itself. That idea would be absurd to both Christians and worshippers of Uhamari alike. The novel Efuru ends as follows, quote, she dreamt of the woman of the lake. She gave women beauty and wealth, but she had no child. Why then did women worship her? Ifuru apparently dreamt that Uhamari didn't have children of her own. At a superficial glance, she may have even, even doubted the goddess' ability to give children to humans, as suggested by some readers. But it is also conceivable that Ifuru, and by extension Nwapa herself, doubted the sole benefit of the divine gift of fertility to women. Oguta Ibo culture venerates female fecundity. A woman's greatest value is believed to be her ability to produce children. In her pioneering novel, Ifuru, Flora Mappa deconstructed such beliefs by creating an antithesis. Ifuru is a childless Oguta woman whose fate represents a dichotomy to social expectations. Yet, the childless heroine is portrayed positively. From this very opposition emerges the recognition that of a woman's worth beyond her fecundity. She moves ahead and is empowered by a local deity who supports her beyond, not instead, of childbearing. Florin Wappa actually corroborates indigenous beliefs in the lake goddess who can give to humans even more than children, such as in the word of an old Oguta woman, woman who told me, Uhamari gives children and everything else. So Ephora's dream of the childless goddess provokes the question, isn't goddess woman valued by herself an asset to society even without a child? Nwapa's dialectic opposition creates a dynamic that vindicates womanhood and projects female powers and potentials on several levels from the deep past into the far-flung future. Thank you. <laughs>